So the question is, will artificial intelligence replace us? So we're aware of Hollywood films depicting artificial intelligence as either a dutiful sidekick or a murderous psychopathic agent. Uh, and we hear from newspapers weekly, if not daily, about breakthroughs in artificial intelligence that uh, seem to be achieving tasks that we thought were impossible, um, or at least far off into the future. We see uh, algorithms for uh, advanced trading being deployed in the finance sector. And we also see the technology being used to read and write reports and sift through these vast quantities of data that financial firms generate or are subjected to, either f to leverage it for value or to comply with uh, compliance from regulators. So people see these achievements and they think, well, gee, is, are we going to be replaced by AI or are we going to be uh, helped by, it's going to augment our um, capabilities? So this is a question I get asked often. Uh, and this leads to, uh, I guess, the next question. So it's difficult to predict both the development of technology uh, and also the impact of technologies that have been developed for a couple of reasons. But I'll give an example. Uh, science fiction often is helpful. So if you think of a television show like Star Trek, this was 50, 60 years ago, they were imagining transporting people and spaceships traveling at the speed of light, but they didn't imagine autonomous uh, driving spacecraft. They had a captain who was giving commands to an underling and they were steering it much like an ocean liner. And you'll see this um, um, repeated as our inability or our limited ability to predict, uh, to see ahead into the future of what uh, tech, what the future will be like, uh, and this is partly for well for a number of reasons. One is that technologies develop in a soup, really, not in isolation. So, people may imagine uh, a particular technology being used for a particular purpose, and but they're also doing that imagination in a, at a particular time with the other technologies that are in place. So you'll see a mixture of things uh, in the past of predictions about what what the future may look like, where they they seem to be spot on, and in other cases where they're 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 not, or they're a little bit they're a little bit off. So why is this so? Right. So the first reason is that, um, as I said, technologies tend to be developed uh, in concert with other technologies. So you may be thinking about a particular goal or a particular use of a piece of technology, but often other things will develop along the line and people can't foresee or imagine how those other developments will influence what we think uh, to deploy uh, this thing that we're developing. Uh, the second thing is there's something called uh, Amera's Law. We tend to overestimate the short-term impacts of technology and underestimate the long-term impacts. So to give an example, autonomous vehicles, this technology has been around for about 30 years. And yes, recently there have been companies that have capitalized and are positioning themselves to move in uh, to offer these services. But we should keep in mind that there's still some obstacles. And I'll give you two examples. One, uh, it's turned out there's a recent paper that came out that you can hack uh, speed limit signs with tape and to trick systems into reading signs as stop signs. It wouldn't look like a stop sign to us, but you can configure uh, configure signs so that the system, the autonomous system, uh, misinterprets these signs. So that's a problem that wouldn't, wouldn't uh, thwart human drivers, but would thwart uh, autonomous vehicles. Another issue is bicyclists, it turns out, because um, they need to be identified. They're not really pedestrians. They're not really motor vehicles. And so uh, they're very difficult for the vehicles to identify and, and deal with properly. So that's the first part of Amera's law. I think it applied to this example, but you can see it across the scale that uh, in other examples that these technologies are coming coming online, but the, these early demonstrations, uh, in many cases, 
uh, doesn't mean that these industries are going to be transformed overnight. Relatedly, we also sometimes overestimate the abilities of artificial intelligence. And I think one thing that we do is it, it's a misunderstanding of the, of the technology. AlphaGo, which was a program developed by DeepMind and Google, uh, beat a professional um, Go player. And then just this last spring, uh, AlphaGo beat the number one ranked player. We're not surprised when we learn that the, these professional players uh, that AlphaGo beat were precocious children. Uh, when they were interviewed after the matches against AlphaGo, they were very reflective and thoughtful uh, and had other attributes that we would, were not surprised to learn that they have very high cognitive capabilities. But the AlphaGo um, is a very different kind of thing. It wasn't aware that it was winning at Go. It could have no conversation about its strategy or how it performed. It was, and it's not just an issue of it not being programmed to do this. It's a very, it's one thing to be able to perform these tasks very well or better than humans. And it's another to give an explanation or to try to teach, say, a person what they're doing. It's a completely different task. And in fact, probably the most surprising thing that we've learned in artificial intelligence is how far we can go in performing tasks that we thought would require these broad uh, abilities without any understanding at all. So. That idea, I think, will eventually, um, will eventually come to understand, just as we've come to understand how other technologies work. Um, but probably the first thing to keep in mind is thinking, wow, this machine is able to read thousands of documents and extract sentences or even summarize news. Or, wow, this machine is able to drive uh, a car or a large truck down, down a road. Or this... Uh, piece of machinery or AI can beat the very best chess champion, the very best Go champion, and win at Jeopardy and, and these other kinds of tasks. Each of these programs were individually engineered systems. It's not the case that you can pick up one and it has the ability to do any of these other tasks. And that's not to diminish the achievement uh, of each of these systems at all, but it's just that we need to understand their, their limitations. So we can't look at them and think that they have all of these other abilities because we're imagining what it would take a human being to perform uh, at this level and exceed the very best human actors at each of these skills. So that's another issue. We overestimate AI, I think, because we, we anthropomorphize them. We, we don't recognize how different they are um, uh, designed and how they're approaching these problems very differently than how we would. Uh, one ought not to confuse the possible with the inevitable uh, and also to anticipate what the consequences will be. So for example, we have uh, automatic, well they're called in the United States anyway, automatic teller machines. So the, the cash machines, cash points where you uh, extract uh, money from your bank account. These things were introduced in New York City in 1969, and uh, by, I think it was 2010, there was something like 570,000 of these in the United States. So you might ask, what happened to bank tellers from, say, 1970 to 2010? And the surprising answer is that the employment of bank tellers increased over this time, didn't de decrease. And part of the answer is that the job of a bank teller changed. It evolved. So it goes back to what we were saying before. We were talking about technology being uh, evolving in this uh, adaptive environment. But there's also people and uh, also adapting to these technologies. And it can be very difficult to, to predict. Will artificial intelligence replace us? The upshot really is that that's a difficult question to answer. But we can identify three reasons why it's a difficult question to answer. One is there's 
a good deal of uncertainty, uh, both in terms of what the consequences of, the, of each technology will be and to how soon that uh, those consequences will realize themselves. And we saw examples of, of each of those. Another uh, reason why this is a difficult question to answer is because there's a healthy dose of misunderstanding about what these technologies can and cannot do. So when we see um, AI, uh, an AI system perform very well at winning a game show or driving a car or reading vast amounts of documents, reading and writing uh, reports from consuming vast amounts of, of information, we imagine what a comparable human being would be like that was able to do any of those tasks. But what we saw from our discussion earlier is that that's the wrong way to think about this. And, and so just because there's a particular system that's been designed and engineered to perform a particular task, there are many things that we would naturally expect a human being who could do this, do that task at that level, to do that these machines just cannot do. And they're not, it's not simply that there aren't engineered uh, to do this, but that we know we don't know how to make them to do this. So we're not completely at sea at, at predicting the impacts of AI. I mean, when, if you're in a particular industry, you'll have some idea of, of the developments within that industry. But even more generally, there's a couple of economic indicators we, we can look to to get a sense of whether or not these vast impact that's been predicted is coming. One is productivity. So if more jobs in a particular sector or across the economy were automated, we would see this in productivity growth, and we're not seeing anything of the kind. The second thing you could look to, an economic indicator, is job churn. So if a particular sector or across the economy you saw people skipping from one employer to the next or from one industry to the next, you would see this show up as also an indicator that automation was having an impact. And in general, now we're, we're still speaking in general, uh, we're seeing low, historically low rates of job churn, in the, again, in the United States uh, since 2000. Uh, so that would include before the economic crisis and also after. So again, this is not to say that uh, these changes won't occur, but it's to emphasize again this overestimation of the impact of this technology in this short-term and most recent window.